Welcome to week one of Mr. Partee's History 2301 Texas History course. This week we will briefly examine prehistoric Texas. Before we look at prehistoric Texas, we should first br briefly look at the different theories of how early Homo sapiens first arrived into the Western Hemisphere. Academics provide a plethora of theories to explain this. I will very briefly explain three of them. The purpose of this is for you to be familiar with the different theories currently being presented in the academic world. If you so decide, you can do further research into the theories for your own understanding. The three theories that will be mentioned in this slide deck will be the first one, the Bering Land Bridge Theory, in which human migration happened over a land bridge between Asia and Canada. The second theory is that human migration was conducted crossing over waterways from Asia to the Western Hemisphere. The third solution is the Solitarian hypothesis in which human migration came from Europe through Greenland to the Western Hemisphere. The first hypothesis that has dominated the academic world for decades is the Bering Land Bridge Theory. It is theory is that vast ice sheets were believed to have covered the Arctic region. About 13,000 years ago, the ice sheets began retreating, opening a 900 mile long ice free corridor following the Canadian Rockies. This, many researchers believe, is how human migration moved south and colonized other parts of the Americas. The coastlines in North America were believed to have increased because of the water being frozen up north. This included Texas. If you look at the lower left part of the picture, you will see the Texas and southeastern coastlines extending into the Gulf of Mexico by a significant amount. The second theory is that human migration happened along coastal routes and not over land. The challenges to the Bering Land Bridge theory is being based on new evidence questioning the land bridge timeline of human migration. Researchers, research shows that humans were living south of the ice sheets before the ice-free corridor opened up. A settlement in Mount Verde, Chile, down in South America, shows people had made it all the way down to South America 15,000 years ago. There is even a theory that some of the early human migration may have occurred by boats from Japan across the South Pacific to South America, as the Polynesian people had done inhabiting islands in the Pacific. The further challenge to the land bridge theory, new research shows that there just weren't enough resources in the past for the early earliest human migra migrants to successfully meet the Bering Land Bridge crossing. Even though the physical corridor was opened by 13,000 years ago, it was several hundred years before it was possible to use it. A third hypothesis that challenges the, the land bridge theory involves around a new theory called the Solitarian Hypothesis. At the height of the last ice age, mysterious Stone Age European people known as the Solitarians paddled along on ice cap on the ice cap in the North Atlantic. It is theorized that human migration may have come from regions of France and Spain. They lived like Inuits, harvesting seals and seabirds. Solitarians eventually spread across North America, hauling distinctive solitarian blades and tools with them and giving birth to the later Clovis culture, which emerged from 13,000 years ago. Today, the topic of the earliest peoples of the Western Hemisphere is a subject of sometimes heated debate among archaeologists and shows no sign of letting up. You, do, you yourself do not need to know the details of these theories for test purposes. The purpose of this slide is to provide you with the different theories of how early humans may have crossed into the Western Hemisphere. Academics have theorized that the first Paleo Indians arrived in South Plains the panel in Texas about 12 to 15,000 years ago. During, during the late uh, Pleistocene era, also known as the Ice Age, early humans extended migration into the trans pecos central and coastal portions of modern Texas. This cultural time period is historically categorized by the creation and shape of weapons, especially spearheads. Archaeologists would normally name their items after the nearest town were found. The example of this are the Clovis people, which is named after Clovis, New Mexico, in the fossil New Mexico people, based on the fluted points that they found by that town uh, during previous archaeological digs. 
The Clovis and Folsom peoples are two of the most popular categorizations of Palo Indians used in archaeological discussions. Sometimes these Palo Indians are referred to as the Clovis people and Folsom people. Today, Texas has numerous archaeological sites for scientists to study. We will look at three of them and what their contributions to the science of archaeology has been. They are the Buttermilk Creek archaeological site, the Bonfire Shelter archaeological site, and the Heinz Cave archaeological site. The first archaeological site we will look at is the Buttermilk Creek archaeological site. It's located outside of present-day Salado, Texas. Archaeologists started digging there in roughly the year 2006. Artifacts found are believed to be roughly 15,000 years old, which would predate Clovis culture and the Bering Land Bear theory by about 2,500 to 3,000 years. It is theorized that the Paleoindians picked the buttermilk site for the Edward Church stone, a stone that is easy to make tools out of in weapons. They made tools out of the stone by removing flakes of the church stone to get a desired shape. They would have then used smaller deer antlers to make these items into spear points, knives, or other, t or other tools. One way to think about Mudmilk Creek archaeological site is that this may have been the home depot for early Texas as their desire for tools and weapons increased. The second site we will look at is the Bonfire Shelter Archaeological Site. It is located on the Rio Grande near Langtree in Valverde County. The bonfire shelter is also known as Buffalo Falls because of the nearly because of the early humans practice of running buffalo off the cliff just above the bonfire shelter cave entrance. Archaeologists found the bones of early now extinct forms of elephant, camel, horse, and bison in the in the cave's floor. Early Texas used a bonfire shelter during three known periods: twelve to fifteen, twelve to fourteen thousand years ago, ten thousand years ago, and seven thousand years ago. And it is believed that the third one, the 7,000 years ago, was when they used to stampede the, the buffalo as we know today off the cliff. The site was excavated in three layers. Archaeologists have found the remains of an ex estimated Asian bison in the cave. Also found were numerous stone tools, including projectile points, similar to the ones found in central Texas at the Buttermilk Archaeological Site. Pollen and other environmental indicators support the theory that during a short interlude about 2,600 years ago, the, the grasslands of the southern plains extended into the lower Pecos, bringing the bison herds and hunters into the region until a return to arid conditions forced the grasslands retreat back up north. This is an artist's rendition of what the trans Pecos area in Valverde County might have looked like. The elephants and camels would probably have looked different than this. It is believed that two types of prehistoric elephants roamed these plains. There was, there was also an extinct horse that once called these plains home. It is also believed that a prehistoric camel and a ground sloth may have inhabited this region. It is theorized that the buffalo from this time period would have been three to four times bigger than the normal buff, buffalo bison that we know today. The map of where the bonfire shelter cave is located is located in Valverde County is presented on the slide. You can see its entrance in the bottom portion of the river's bend and the lower right part of the, pair of the photograph on the left. Here's a picture of the opening to the bonfire shelter cave. You can see how convenient it would have been for prehistoric Texans to run buffalo off the cliff above the cave, then to simply walk a short distance to the animal's carcass to retrieve meat and hides and bring it back to the cave. Here's an artist's artist rendition of what a buffalo hunt may have looked like using a cliff located above the bonfire shelter cave. This practice is what gave the bonfire shelter the name Buffalo Falls. This picture shows the intricate work archaeologists conducted to ensure every inch of a site is inspected. The third archaeological site mentioned in the slide deck is the Heinz Cave. It is located in Balverde County, northwest, northwest of Del Rio, Texas. It is located on the Pecos River near Bonfire Shelter, which is on the Rio Grande. It is theorized that early Texans began using Heinz Cave about 9,100 years ago. It is technically a rock shelter and not a cave. Art, artifacts found 
There it gives more detail about the diet of the early Texans. They were able to do this by studying capillites, which are fossilized human feces. By studying the highest cave capillites, scientists were able to confirm the reliance that the early Texans had on being successful hunter-gatherers. They ate 23 different animals and 22 different plants. Their diet included deer, rabbit, raccoon, coyotes, catfish, snakes, birds, lizards, rats, and mice. They also ate hatberries, persimmons, grapes, wild onions, prickly pear, yucca plants, soto, and grass seeds. Pretty much anything they could get their hands on that was not poisonous was in their diet. Ice Cave also tells of how big their population was, numbering about 25 to 30 members in one group. It is believed that possibly only 1,000 paleo Indians total occupied a 14,000 square mile radius of the trans pecos region. This slide shows the entrance to the Heinz Cave and the archaeological crews working to excavate the site. It is theorized that cave paintings found in areas like Valverde County were created by holy men called shamans. Early Texans believed that shamans could visit the supernatural world after falling into a drug-induced stupor, usually from, a, from ingesting peyote. The public can see some of the Valverde County cave art up close at places like Seminole Canyon State Park and possibly Panther Cave, both outside of Comstock, Texas. This slide is just a basic description of the, of the different areas of human cultural advancement in accordance with different archaeological finds and the use of carbon dating. You do not need to memorize this slide, it is just for your basic understanding. We will skip down to the arch archaic cultural time period to study early Texans' advances in tool creation. Prehistoric Texans created new tools that included gravers, scrapers, knives, axes, choppers, picks, and drills. Archaeologists have also found bone tools besides stone tools. This period is interesting because prehistoric Texans started to, to plant food, thus creating a sustainable food source that they can control instead of having to rely on finding roaming herds of, of animals. This is important because we start to see early Texans choose a more sedentary lifestyle over being nomadic wanderers following the herd animals. It is theorized that the bow and arrow was not created at this time, though the dog was believed domesticated during the archaic period. As mentioned in the previous slide, we see that prehistoric Texans start to create new tools to support a sedentary lifestyle centered around farming. Therefore, culturally, prehistoric Texans start to follow two separate paths for food sustainability. The first one is nomadic, and, and as the name implies, nomadic people follow the migrating animals for food, which was mainly the buffalo. Nomadic people lived in temporary housing or natural shelters. They tended to move around due to seasons, trying to, mostly trying to escape the, the cold and going into warmer, warmer regions. The biggest technological advantage uh, for the nomadic people would be the horse. Uh, an example of a tribe that successfully did this would, was the Comanches. The second, the second cultural sustainability group was the farmers. They were no longer dependent on wild sources for food. They could control food production instead of hoping to find it like nomads did with roaming animal herds. It also frees up parts of the population to pursue other ventures such as priests, chiefs, traders, artisans, soldiers, and healers. Corn was a staple of their diet. Other crops that were wild and were since domesticated included potatoes, beans, squash, pumpkins, peanuts, tomatoes, chocolate, rubber, long staple cotton, grains, and tobacco. The world of today owes these people much gratitude for cultivating foods that we take for granted today. They also built more permanent structures, normally out of grass and adobe style materials. With large po populations becoming sedentary, increasing their population centers, people started to create fed confederations with other tribes of people. They also start to trade. The Aztecs and Mayas are perfect examples of this progression. In Texas, we will see this somewhat with the Caddos tribe in Northeast Texas. This map 
defines the regional names of where prehistoric Texans migrated to and foreign tribes. These names are still used to generally describe geographic regions of Texas. This map shows where the tribes that migrating humans created in Texas were located. Some of the tribes, such as the Comanches and Kiowas, arrived in Texas well after the archaic period. When the Spaniards first explored Texas, this is the general location of the tribes they encountered here. The following slides will better explain the characteristics of each tribal people. They will be, ground, they will be grouped by the four Greek geographic regions listed on the previous slide. The first area we'll, we'll study is the coastal area, with the, the first tribe being the Colotecans, also known as the inland, inland group people. They, lived, they had Tizzy live in what is known today as northeast, northern Mexico and, and south Texas. They were simple, simple hunter-gatherers. Their principal food supply was agave plants, but they also lived off cactus fruit, rabbits, rodents, reptiles, birds, bugs, deer, javelina, and low, some and some bison. Besides the agave, no food supply was reliable enough to fully support the called Tekans. Life was a constant struggle for survival for them. Besides the scarce food supply, the called Tekans were caught in the middle between Spanish colonizers and their diseases and the Apache raiders. This caused the population to go into a steep decline during the early Spanish colonial period. Eventually, the survivors gathered in Spanish missions for protection, mainly from the Apaches. By 1800, most of the remaining Coltecans had merged with other tribes or had intermarried with the Hispanic population. The second tribal group of the coastal area is the Karankawa, also known as, as simply the coastal group people. The Karankawas were the name given to several related groups who had lived along the Texas coast, mainly from Galveston and Corpus Christi. They were nomads who mainly lived off the sea. Food sources were seasonal as no food was continuously plentiful. They reported they reportedly practiced cannibalism. It is theorized that they did not eat human flesh for food, but for magic or revenge. It is believed that the current commons were the first Indians in Texas to encounter Europeans. And the first European they, is believed they encountered was the Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, a survivor of a shipwreck from an earlier Spanish expedition. In the 1700s, the Karankawas faced renewed attempts of the Spanish and French to settle the coast as well as incursions from other Indian tribes, including the Tonkawas and Comanches. These contacts brought both war and epidemic diseases. By the 1840s, the remnants of these people had moved into the lower Rio Grande Valley, where they were annihilated in 1858 by a Mexican and Texan force that did not want cannibals living on their haciendas. This believed the problem with the Karankawas was they never adapted to the changing times. For example, they never mastered the use of the horse, firearms, permanent structures for housing, or better clothing. They always assisted in practicing prehistoric ways for sustenance and living. The next geographic region we'll look at is the Plains Indians. And the first tribal group that we'll look at is the Apaches or the Lipan Apaches. The Apache culture first started north in Canada, where bands of Apaches can still be found today. Other bands of Apaches migrated south through the high plains, working their way along the eastern flank of the Rocky Mountains. The Apaches eventually reached the lower southern plains, dominating almost all of West Texas and ranging over a wide area from Arkansas to Arizona. Two groups of Apaches, the Lipans and the Muscaleros, were the two bands of primary importance in Texas history. The Apaches were among the first Indians to learn to ride horses and lived a nomadic existence following the buffalo. They also farmed, growing maize, beans, pumpkins, and watermelons. During the era of Spanish rule, the Apache staged constant raids against the Spanish missions. But as the safety hunters wore on, they found themselves subject to being raided themselves from the even more fearsome Comanches. Eventually, they entered an on-again, off-again relationship with the Spanish, sometimes warring and raiding, other times allying with them, themselves with the Spanish against the Comanches and other enemies. When the Anglo-Americans began moving into Texas, the Apaches cultivated a friendship with them as an ally against the Comanches, but this broke down in 1842. Eventually, the Lipan and Muscalero Apaches moved across the Mexican border and began a series of destructive border raids into Texas that lasted for decades. 
It was not until 1873 that the U.S. Army, under Colonel Ronald S. McKenzie, led a force into Mexico, destroying the Apache villages, and forced the survivors onto a reservation in, in New Mexico. The bottom line I want you to remember about the Apaches is this. The Apaches hated everybody, Indians and Europeans alike. And everybody, Indians and Europeans alike, hated the Apaches. The second tribe of the Plains Indians is the Comanches. The Comanches, like the Apaches, had their origins in Canada before migrating south to the High Plains. They were at least 13 active bands of Comanches known, with five playing prominent roles in Texas history. After the Spanish introduced the horse to the Native Americans, the Comanches became fierce, became fierce horsemen. These unparalleled horsemen led a nomadic lifestyle following the buffalo. They controlled trade in produce, buffalo products, horses, and captives throughout their domain. Some military historians have listed the Comanches as one of the top light cavalry units in world history. With the horse, Comanches were also able to extend their influence throughout the High Plains. This included dominating a vast area in North, Central, and West Texas. This area is sometimes referred to as Comanchetia. With the Comanches, if you weren't their ally, then you were their enemy. During raids and warfare, the Comanches would capture women and children and incorporate them into the Comanche nation. For the men, though, they would not kill them outright. They preferred to watch them die slowly for entertainment. It was this reputation that made them so feared by other Indians and white settlers alike. In the 1700s, the Comanches made their presence known in Texas by warring with the Apaches and the Spanish. Fearing that they would lose Texas to the Comanches, the Spanish negotiated a peace treaty with them in 1785. When the Spanish were unable to keep their promises and trades and goods and gifts, Comanches resumed their trading, their raiding against the Spanish, with many of the stolen horses being traded to newly arrived Americans. After the Texas Revolution, Americans wanted to settle in the Texas Plains. The Comanches fiercely resisted their encroachment with destructive and deadly raids on the frontier. A cycle of raiding and retaliation on both sides climaxed during the time of the Republic of Texas. After Texas became a state, a number of communities were defeated by disease, warfare, and the depletion of the buffalo herds. They were still a force to reckon with, often slowing down the settlement of West Texas. Eventually, in the 1870s, the communities were forced to surrender and began the painful transition to, re to reservation life. Their tribal government today operates near Lawton, Oklahoma. The third tribe of the Plains Indians is the Kiowas. The Kiowas originated in the area of modern-day Yellowstone National Park, but then migrated south after the introduction of the horse. At the community, they became great horsemen and thus one of the most feared of the Plains tribes. The Spanish called part of the Kiowas, Kiowa Apaches, but not much is known of that group, so it is generally believed to be mostly associated with just the name Kiowas. The Kiowas formed a strong alliance with the communities around 1790, and together with the Arapaho and Southern Cheyennes, successfully held back Spanish and American expansion into the Southern Plains for decades. The Kiowas would lead some of the biggest raids and attacks against settlers in the 19th century. These attacks led the U.S. Army to adopt a much more aggressive policy toward the Kiowas and their allies, and by June of 1875, the tribe was forced onto the Fort Sill Reservation in Oklahoma. The fourth, the fourth Indian tribe of the Plains Indians was the Tonkawas. The fourth tribe of the Tonkawas were actually a group of independent bands. The remnants of these bands were eventually united in the early 18th century in the region of Central Texas, where they were given the name Tonkawas. The name Tonkawa is a Waco term, meaning they all stay together. Traditionally, the Tonkawas have been regarded as an old Texas tribe, but new evidence suggests that the Tonkawas migrated from the High Plains down south as late as the 17th century. Unfortunately, little is known as social or political organization of Tonkawas prior to their consolidation, so it's difficult to determine their true origin. The Tonkawas were initially enemies with the Apaches, probably because the later pushed them from the Buffalo Plains onward south into Texas. When the communities in Wichita's migrated southward and began to pressure the Apaches, the Tonkawas allied themselves with the new arrivals. Later, when their alliance with the communities soured, the Tonkawas allied themselves with the Texas settlers. The Tonkawas lived in short, squat teepees covered with buffalo hides. But as the buffalo hides became scarce, they started using grass and other type of, uh, of branches to replace the buffalo skin teepee. For sustenance, they relied on deer since they could not get to the buffalo. They also ate rabbits, skunks, rats, and land tortoises. Rattlesnakes were considered a delicacy. 
They would not eat wolves or coyotes for religious reasons, but would eat dogs and horses. They were about the only plains Indians to eat oyster and fish. They also gathered food from the local vegetation, and they were not known for being successful farmers. The Tonquas remained staunch allies of, North, of Texas settlers. They were given land by Texas for a reservation, but other Indian tribes and settlers accused them of raiding forced them from it. Eventually, most of the Tonquas and a few associated Lipan Apaches moved to a reservation in Indian territory in what is now known as Oklahoma. In, 18, in 1951, the Tonquas had intermarried with Lipan Apaches, other, other Indians or whites, to the extent that they were no longer distinguishable as a separate group. The fourth area that we'll cover is the Northeast Texas Indians. And the first tribe that we'll look at are, are, the, are called the Wichitas. The Wichita Band of Indians was one of the successful bands that composed the Wichita Confederacy. The name Wichita was first found in the early 17th century in historic records of French traders who used the word Wasitas to identify one band of Indians who lived near the Arkansas River in present Oklahoma. The Wichitas are, were dependent on both agriculture and hunting for sustenance. They lived in villages of dome-shaped grass houses and farmed extensive fields of corn, tobacco, and melons along the streams where they made their homes. Whenever they left their villages for annual hunts, they they would cache their, their stores of agricultural and other foods in the in the grounds along the banks of the rivers. Wichita's were known for their raccoon eyes because of designs of tattoos around the men's eyes. They were also slightly darker in color than other native people of Texas. They had little ritualistic religion, but were impressed by the natural forces around them and gave expression to them in mythology and stories. Although the Wichita's were warriors by tradition, they tended to be friendly toward strangers and avoided confrontations unless provoked. Their villages were landmarks on the southern plains and were well laid out and clearly distinguishable by their grass lodges and nearby fields. The second tribe of the Northeast Texas Indians were the Atacapas. The Atacapas occupied the coastal and bayou areas of southwestern Louisiana and southeastern Texas until the early 1800s. Archaeological studies of this area suggest that settlements have been present since before American Indians learned to make pottery about the time of the birth of Christ. It is believed that the Atacapas practiced cannibalism. As a matter of fact, Atacapa means eaters of men in Choctaw. The question has been raised whether the Atacapas cannibalism was for sustenance or ritual. Atacapa society consisted of loose bands that moved from place to place within a set area of territory where they practiced gathering, hunting, and fishing for sustenance. The alligator was important to them for it provided meat, oil, and hides. The oil of the alligator was used as an insect repellent. The Atacapas were reported to have engaged in some, some type of trade, not only with other Indians, but also with the French and Spanish. With the coming of the Europeans, the ranks of the Atacapas thinned rapidly. It is believed there were 3,500 in 1698, but only 175 in Louisiana in 1805. By 1908, there were only nine known descendants. Their demise was primarily caused by the invasion of European diseases rather than through direct confrontations with European settlers or other Indian tribes. The third Northeast Texas Indian tribe we will look at are the Caddos. The Caddos are not only one of at least 25 distinct but closely affiliated groups of, of Caddo bands. They had a tendency to, to form confederations not only with other Caddo bands but also Indian groups that were located nearby. This ability to form confederations with, with different Caddo bands and other Indian groups gave the Caddos the moniker of being the Roman Empire of Texas. In prehistoric times, Cado, the Caddos lived in dispersed communities of grass and cane covered houses. The Caddos created mounds used as platforms for temple structures for civic and religious functions. The Caddos were successful farmers but also relied on the deer for a source of meat. They also ate buffalo and beer, and beer to some extent whenever both species would roam into the region. They developed long distance trade networks in prehistoric times with Indians and the Spanish. They were considered technologically advanced 
as they were able to develop unique tools for unique functions. The fourth geographic area that we'll look at is the Transpecus area, also known as West Texas. And the tribe that we'll study there is the Jumanos. The Jumanos is a name given to three distinct groups who range over northern Mexico, New Mexico, and Texas. Their primary base was in the Big Bend area of Texas. So Spanish explorers sometimes refer to the Jumanos as the naked Indians because their breasts and genitalia were not covered. However, both men and women did wear garments and shoes, probably moccasins of tanned skins. The Jumanos were characterized as a striped people because of a distinctive pattern of facial and body markings and horizontal lines or bars on their beings. The Jumanos were buffalo hunters and traders. They actually traded amongst the different Jumano groups in the region. It is also believed that the Jumanos may have traded with other Indian tribes as far away as the Wichita's and Cano's in Northeast Texas. During the Spanish years, the Germanos were active in organizing trade fairs between the Spanish and other Indians. They sometimes worked as scouts and missionaries for the Spanish, but rebelled against them in the early 1600s. Nomadic Germanos used buffalo hide teepees, with some bands living in more permanent structures made of reeds or sticks. There were also others that lived in pebbles in New Mexico that had masonry houses. The Germanos hunted with bow and arrow, and in war used clubs or cudgels of hardwood. The Manos were also able to obtain horses from the Spanish, though they were not skilled horsemen as the Comanches or Kiowas. In the 1660s, the Germanos faced a rapid population decline due to famine and war with the Apaches. By 1700, they had lost all their territory and trade routes. Their culture eventually died out, with the survivors drifting to join other tribes, including the Apaches. Some scholars believe that a small group of Germanos became the foundation of the Kiowas in Texas. This concludes the prehistoric Texas presentation, your week one slide deck.